Uh, well, I'm very grateful for this invitation to uh, speak a little bit about this connection between proofs and, and nuts. And uh, I think it, there is a, a lot to explore still. So I will just, uh, you know, explain a little bit the, the basic ideas. And I love this picture that, I, you know, in a way summarizes the talk. So it's about, you know, how a proof can be seen as some kind of naughty structure, which has to do with the structure of dialogue. Okay. And so uh, it's a long question, you know, uh, about what is a logical proof, how should we should represent it, describe it, and how we could have a properly, you know, mathematical notation for, for proofs. And my starting point in, in this talk is the idea of game semantics. So the idea is that every proof of, form, of a formula A initiates a dialogue where proponent tries to convince opponent and opponent tries to refute proponent. And this is really uh, a nice interactive understanding of proofs. And so uh, here is a typical proof in, uh, let's say, some, some kind of Genson uh, notation, traditional notation. It's a little bit cryptic, a bit difficult to understand what's behind. So, uh, but the, uh, I mean, what it proves uh, is a so called drinker's formula which says that in any uh, open cafe <laughs> in Paris, okay, with at least, so we need one, one drink, I mean, one customer, okay? So uh, in the cafe, so uh, there exists a, a specific customer Y, which is so sober, it's very sober customer Y, such that if uh, uh, A of Y, which means that Y is drinking, then all the other customers in the cafe are also drinking. Okay. And clearly this is counterintuitive, but this is proved by this uh, short proof in classical uh, logic. Okay. This, this property is not true, is not valid in uh, intuitionistic logic or constructive uh, logic, but it is valid in classical logic. And, and here is the proof. And I said that the a proof gives a strategy uh, some interactive strategy to convince you. So we could, I mean, I, I could play it with you. So, okay, imagine I want to convince you of this property, which you think is a little bit strange. Well, we opened, I mean, we enter together in the cafe and then I say, okay, I, I know the customer was, uh, I mean, was very sober. So I could pick someone. So for instance, uh, I, I don't know, uh, Gerard, if you allow me, I will say, okay, Gerard, you're, you're very sober, so I know that, okay, if ever you drink, everybody else will be drinking in the cafe, yes. And then uh, the point is, uh, well, uh, I may be wrong, okay? So uh, you may be drinking, uh, Gérard, but then someone else in the cafe is not drinking. And so my opponent will refute me and say, come on, Paul, you're just wrong. Uh, this." Customer, so I don't know. Nicola, do you do you allow to be, you know, the counter witness? Uh, so okay, say okay, come on. You know, here uh, I see Nicola is is not. Uh, I mean, it's not so. It's, so he's, he's a counter example to your claim. And so the proof, what it does interactively, is to allow me to backtrack. And so this is a little bit hidden here in the fact that there is two existential here uh, introductions in the rules. It allows me as uh, you know prover to backtrack and say, oh, sorry, I was wrong. I shouldn't have picked, uh, you know, uh, Gérard at the beginning. I should have picked Nicola, okay? And so the idea is that the fact, I mean, the reason why the existential here is not constructive, okay, uh, has to do with the fact that I did use the witness from the interaction I have with the, with the opponent. Okay. So in a way I cheat, okay. but this is exactly the way classical logic works uh, interactively. And I mean, you can, you know, instead of speaking about the drinker formula, you can say that this formula says that every, every uh, you know, proposition uh, is either true or as a counterexample. I mean, you can think of uh, the why here as a counterexample. And of, I mean, and clearly, you know, before a property is proved, uh, well, this still this this property holds because if someone finds a counterexample, then we have the counterexample. I mean, this is the same story I've told you here. Uh, okay, and so in a way, this syntax is a little bit, uh, you know, 
difficult to understand, while the game semantics gives a more, much more uh, intuitive understanding of it. And so let me speak briefly about uh, you know, the way uh, you know, game semantics and algebra are, are connected. So this is through linear logic and uh, a number of connectives, which in fact are really uh, adapted or are really uh, uh, consistent with linear linear algebra. Okay, and so here we have negation, which is really like a dual in, uh, and I will come back to that in, uh, in linear algebra between the game A played by uh, you know the uh, the player and the game not A, same game but played now seen from the point of view of the opponent, and so negation permutes the holes of opponent and proponent. Uh, the sum here. Uh, is uh, what it does. It says, okay, let, let's start with two games. So there is a game A and a game B. They are sum. So imagine this is chess and poker, for instance. Okay. The sum of the game is the game where I, as a player, decides whether I want to play chess or I want to play uh, uh, poker. And then once it's decided, we carry on. We never come back to the other board. Uh, and so this is understood as here as this disjunction. Okay, it's a choice I do as a player, but there is a, a, a dual uh, connective which is just the same, but where opponent makes the choice, and this is understood has a form of conjunction, because if I let the opponent, you know, the environment choose, then clearly I should be a master in chess, but also a master in poker if I want to to uh, you know, win the game, because I don't know what the opponent will choose. And so this is really uh, some, a notion of constructive you know, conjunction. It's an end. Okay. So this is a little symbol used for end. Uh, but there is also a tensor product where the two games are played in parallel, but, but uh, only opponent is allowed to switch board. Okay. Uh, and so player will just play where uh, opponent has just played. And this is understood as a classical Conjunction. When I say classical, I, I mean in the sense of classical logic. Uh, and there is a dual where it's same, but now player is allowed to switch board. Okay. And the nice thing is that this is can be understood as a form of classical disjunction. And so I will show show you how to establish uh, the the fact that uh, for every formula, so for every game. So here, for instance, let's let's take a determined, you know, version of uh, chess. Uh, well, we have the property that A, let's call it the chess is called property A, or here, not A. So not A, remember, is just you swap the board. And so I will give you an interactive strategy which wins in that game. Um, and so really the idea is that we are playing, I mean, I am playing two boards uh, here in parallel. And here in front of me, there is a tensor product and the tensor product can be seen of, a, I mean, a strategy or a counter strategy of type tensor can be seen as a pair of strategies. So let's say I'm playing against two, you know, uh, famous uh, Russian, uh, you know, chess masters, and I, I will show you how I, I, I can win by playing here uh, white and here playing black. Okay, and of course, I mean, winning, I, you know, I'm not crazy, I, I, I cannot win against both. Or if I want to win against both, I need to, to be a very strong master myself. But here is by pure logic, okay? So there is no, uh, I mean, it's just by some kind of logical, let's say manipulations or lo logical, you know, um, truth, okay? So I want to prove that A or not A, and the strategy to do that is just uh, to let, uh, it's very simple and it's like cheating really, so it's to let Korshnoi start here. And so Korshnoi plays a move like this or here, okay? And then copycat what Korshnoi has, has done on this board. And I can do that because as because this connective enables me to play, I mean, to switch board when because uh, uh, whenever a move has been played on one board, I'm allowed to move to the other board like this. And so I have copycat the move by Korshnoi, Karpov answers, and then I move to the other board and I play like Karpov. Okay. So, and then Korshnoi answers, and I, then I, I, I just move like Korshnoi has just moved. 
And in that way, uh, I just by copy, you know, some kind of copycat strategy. I, I mean, Karp Karpov really believes he's playing against Korshnoi, and Korshnoi is re really believes he's playing against Karpov. And in the end, one of the two wins. And I, uh, so that means that I will lose, maybe Karpov wins, so I, I lose on this board, but I win on this board. And after all, I want to prove that A or not A. And so that means that I only need to win on one of the two boards. Okay, so the idea is that, uh, we, that you know, we can understand, uh, you know, the fact that a property is true or it's uh, negation, uh, something purely interactive and purely linguistic which doesn't have to do with the you know outside world it's not about whether today it's uh, you know cold or hot weather it's really about just pure linguistic uh, phenomena okay and so uh, i mentioned that uh, there is also this exponential modality which is very nice i will not speak about it anymore uh, in, in in this uh, you know uh, talk but it's nice to know that there is something which enables opponent to reopen to reopen uh, balls whenever the opponent is embarrassed. And this is what happened in the drinker formula thing. At some point, I was embarrassed as a player, so I reopened a new board and I won on the new board, on the second board, using information I knew from the first. The fact that, uh, I mean, Nicola was the good witness uh, and not Gerard, okay? And this I learned on the first board and then I used this information on the second board. And so, uh, and by the way, this, uh, I mean, maybe I will have the time to mention it, but this has to do with co-free constructions of co-algebras or commutative co-algebras in vector spaces. And uh, uh, okay, I, I try to come back to this, but now what I will try to show you is that there are connections between these ideas of, uh, you know, game semantics and ideas coming from linear algebra and, uh, representation theory. So, okay, I will I will move uh, that. Uh, okay, and so, but before I do that, there, there is this uh, important, uh, let's say, tool coming from categories and ideas by Lambeck in particular, which is to give a functorial approach to proof invariance in the same way that uh, we will see there is a functorial approach to not invariance. Okay, so, um, so I will uh, speak about the, uh, uh, in particular, I will start from this idea coming from Brewer hating Kolmogorov uh, that a proof of a conjunction, okay, really uh, is a pair consisting of a proof of A and a proof of B. Okay, so, and the idea is that, I mean, from the game semantics point of view is that someone you know, if I claim A and B, my environment, my opponent could attack me on A or on B. So I need to be able to uh, prove A and to prove B. So I should have a proof of A and a proof of B. Okay. And uh, so this is fine. And we will see that this will be interpreted by the existence of a Cartesian product in, in categories. Um, but then there is this more mysterious uh, uh, description of a proof of a formula from A to B in, in logic uh, as an algorithm, which is able to turn any proof of A, uh, phi, into a proof of B, psi of phi. So this algorithm phi, the question is what does, I mean, what does it mean, an algorithm? And this was, a, I mean, this is still a question that people, uh, I mean, it's not so clear, whereas here it's quite clear what it means. Okay, a pair is a pair, but an algorithm is something like saying, okay, I have a notion of algorithm somewhere in the air, but I don't know exactly what it means. And so the, 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 the notion of Cartesian closed category is an attempt to answer that question by saying, come on, okay, an algorithm will be a map in, in a specific category, but this category should be Cartesian, so it should have a, a, a Cartesian product, and it should be closed in the sense that we should have uh, an, an ad, I mean, a family of adjunctions between the functor A times and the functor A implies. Uh, and what this means is that we have a natural uh, bijection uh, between the set of maps from A times B to C and the set of maps from B to A implies C. And we can think of this as 
some kind of implication. So clearly, uh, uh, a basic example is the category of sets and functions. Okay, but there are many, many other examples, uh, and we spend a lot of time, uh, you know, when we study proofs to construct ca Cartesian closed categories of, of I mean, many shapes. Okay. Um, okay. So I mean, just I mean, a typical example is every topos is is such, and uh, you know, every 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 category of sheaves is such, and there are many, many other examples that we can analyze. And it's a, it's very rich and interesting topic. But here I want to focus on the uh, uh, free construction, okay? And so, uh, and you will see it's very symbolic. And so, if you want to say, okay, I, I know I start from a category, and now I want to construct the free Cartesian closed category. And you think about it, you say, okay, I should start by the objects, and the objects they should be constructed from the objects of the original category, and then. Uh, the products and the implications. Okay, so there should be uh, this grammar of objects, uh, and so the, the objects of the category of the free Cart Cartesian closed category are constructed by this grammar. Okay, of uh, uh, so you can think of them as formulas or as types constructed by this 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 very simple grammar with Cartesian product and implication. And here again, Cartesian product is some you can understand it as some kind of conjunction and implication here. Okay, and so the 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 now the morphisms in this category they are not as I mean they they are a bit subtle to define to describe, and I will just say a word about them. So they are lambda terms, and so uh, just to say a little bit uh, you know a, a word about lambda terms. So lambda the lambda terms are terms in the calculus, which is a, a, cal a pure calculus of functions, okay, and I will say a word on that now uh, more. But then these uh, terms of this calculus should be considered modulo some some notion of beta eta conversion. And what I claim here is that the situation is very similar to what we have in knot theory, where we have like this uh, tangle uh, diagrams, okay, and then up to uh, deformation of diagrams, okay, typically Reidemeister uh, moves. Okay. So, uh, so how is the uh, lambda calculus defined? I mean, there is some kind of uh, repre I mean, some kind of um, calculus where you uh, describe functions in a given context. So, uh, typically, you said that there is, for instance, a function x. Okay, uh, this is just a variable in a context where x is of type a. And then x will be here. This term will be of type A. And the most important two rules is the abstraction rule, which says that if you have a term p of, of type b, okay, uh, in a given context where the variable has been declared of type A, then you will construct a function, which is uh, written lambda x dot p. And the function here, you can think of it as the function which to x associates p of x. And so this is the notation here. And its type is the type of functions from A to B. And so I said implication, but you can also think of it as description of uh, the, you know, some kind of uh, function, function space. Okay, all the functions from A to B. Okay, and since the variable here is of, is of type A and the output is of type B, then lambda x dot x, this function is of type from, I mean, A implies B. And we can, once we have constructed such a function from A to B, we can apply it to an argument. So this is the notation. So P is applied to the argument to get something of type B. So the argument is of type A applied. I mean, we apply the function of type A in place B or A to B, and then we get something. And then there are three basic rules here that uh, organize I and mean, that deal with the context. And so then what are the beta and eta rule? So they're very cute rules. I mean, they are very beautiful and powerful. Um, so the first one says, okay, if I have constructed a function uh, which to x associates p of x, and then I apply it to an argument, uh, then I will uh, get, uh, I mean, I can rewrite it into the same, I mean, the p, but now it's p of q. And this is the way it's written here. So the, because it's a pure calculus of functions, we have uh, variables x appearing in p. And so we can then substitute 
item by Q. Okay, and similarly here, there is a rule which says that every term of this calculus can be seen as a function, lambda x, which to x associates the term applied to uh, the argument x. Okay, and this is completely formal, completely symbolic, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, it's known to be connect deeply connected to a language. I mean, a language of proofs. And so these lambda terms here, uh, these lambda terms in red, they can be seen as proofs of some propositions which are written with implication here and, and conjunction. Uh, so there were this, uh, you know, little uh, logic, I mean, calculus here of, of uh, which you can see, think also as a calculus of, of formulas. And here, this is the description of the proofs of these formulas. Uh, but what is important, I mean, okay, I don't ask you to understand all these details about proofs and formulas, but what I want to stress is that there is a, constru a completely algebraic construction of the free Cartesian closed category. And what this means is that whenever I take a category C here, and I have a functor into a Cartesian closed category D, I can lift this functor to, uh, the because D is, is Cartesian closed, I can lift this functor uh, from C to D to a functor which preserves up to coherent isomorphism uh, the uh, pro Cartesian product and the uh, implication arrow, okay, from this free Cartesian closed category into D. And so this gives, so, so this construction is extremely important in the construction of what we call proof invariance. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, you know, I work in a, in, a, in a like computer science lab, and the reason is that in fact this lambda calculus can be seen also as a language of programs. So there is a nice correspondence between proofs here and programs. So you can think of it as a very simple programming language here, if you like, that you transport, you interpret all the so the morphisms are programs, and you interpret them into some category. And so here the category typically will be uh, could be a category like the category of sets and functions could be a you know a pre-shift pre or shift category or a topos or whatever as long as it is Cartesian closed category we have this beautiful little uh, functor okay and the okay this is the story for for you know what 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 I would do you know uh, my, all <laughs> all my day okay constructed this kind of of things okay but then. Uh, uh, people in, in, I mean, studying not invariance, and this is the connection with, with nuts, uh, they do something extremely similar, where instead of constructing, so, so they start from a functor, let's say, okay. I mean, it's one way to think about uh, the construction of not invariance. There are many ways to construct not invariance, but here I will describe the functorial approach, which is to say, okay, if I'm able to, to, to associate to every color, you know, an interpretation in uh, a ribbon uh, category. And I will explain uh, briefly how to construct such ribbon categories uh, using representation uh, theory of uh, quantum groups. So when we have such a ribbon category and a functor into, into that, we can lift the functor uh, that, to a functor which preserves uh, the, the structure uh, of ribbon categories. But this, uh, I mean, this free ribbon category is a, is a category where the morphisms are uh, frame tangles. So in particular, we can study like ribbon knots and we can associate invariance uh, to each ribbon knot because this category is, is, is yeah, um, typically the morphisms from the uh, unit object to, to, to itself are uh, are ribbon, uh, I mean, ribbon diagrams, which are closed. And so they are, they are really like ribbon uh, nuts. Okay. And so you see there is this very, I mean, kind of fascinating uh, uh, analogy between what we do with proofs uh, in the functorial semantics of proofs and the functorial you know, invariance of, of nuts. And so I will try to explain the connection. So I will go very briefly just to explain these uh, uh, ribbon categories on, on string diagrams. So, uh, so it's a notation for monoidal categories. Uh, uh, and so the idea is that a morphism from A tensor B tensor C 
to D tensor E will be described as uh, some diagram with three inputs and two outputs. Okay, so A, B, C here as input and D, E as output. So, so the flow, I mean, goes in that direction from, from the uh, bottom to top. Okay, so this is the arrow here. And so composition is described by vertical composition. So the composition in the category and the tensor product as horizontal, I mean, putting side by side F and G. Uh, so typically here is an example, we have F tensor identity. So F here, identity here, and then F tensor identity composed with identity tensor J. Okay, so, I mean, if you, I mean, if you interpret this morphism here uh, uh, in the string diagram notation, you get this picture. But then if you interpret this other morphism, you get this picture where you see here, uh, F and G have been kind of, uh, I mean, uh, we, I mean, we play with the, uh, the order in which they appear here. And the point is that in a, uh, in a monoidal category, these two morphisms are equal. So really we can be, I mean, we can trust our eyes up to the formation of diagrams. And uh, indeed this diagram here and this diagram here describe the same morphism. Okay, and this is really the beginning of a beautiful story where you try to make you know, this topological uh, intuition uh, uh, valid up to the point where you can say, okay, I have a knot uh, and I, it's described as a morphism in a specific category. And uh, the morphism is, is invariant uh, up to deformation. Okay, so uh, this is what I will explain now, now. Okay, so a braided category or monoidal category is just a monoidal category equipped with a braiding. So, it's a family of isomorphisms from A tensor B to B tensor A. So, and this is the way I will uh, uh, draw them. Okay. I think many people here know this, all this story, but I, I, fe I felt that it's good to, uh, uh, I mean, to tell it um, again anyway. So this is the way the, the, the braiding is described, but of course we are, there is an inverse, which is described as a negative braiding, whereas here it's a positive braiding. Uh, and our coherence diagrams. So this one, for instance, says that these two uh, sequences of arrows are equal in, in the uh, braided uh, monoidal category. And diagrammatically, it says this, okay, that uh, if we uh, permute A with B tensor C is the same as permuting A with B and then permuting A with, with C, okay. Another diagram, which is essentially saying the same, but for, for the other, uh, I mean, uh, configuration. Uh, and so this is like braided monoidal category, but then we can define, I will, and I will be very much interested in the notion of balanced monoidal category. So it's just a braided monoidal category with a twist, which is defined as a family of isomorphisms and which I will depict as a twist like this. Okay, so there is a little like we twist the ribbon. And this is why I work with ribbons rather than just strings. Okay, so we can see this little action here. Uh, on, the, on the ribbon. And so it should satisfy that theta i equals the identity. So when we twist the, the unit, uh, the unit of, I mean, uh, we just do nothing. And then this very nice equation, which says that when we twist the tensor, so where is, where, when we twist the tensor, it's the same as braiding, twisting, braiding, okay? And so this is the way to see it. So if you want, so A and sub B is really A and B in parallel. And so if you twist uh, A and sub B, what, this is what you get. You need to twist A and B independently, but also braid them twice, okay. Uh, so you see, this is a typical example where uh, purely algebraic, you know, uh, coherence property, which says that this map should be equal to this sequence of three maps. Uh, coincides with a very topological intuition, okay, about how we twist uh, ribbons. Okay. And so uh, now uh, I carry on, you know, I, what I'm trying to do now is really to build uh, what I, what I uh, will call a ribbon uh, uh, category. So uh, we have, we need a notion of duality. So uh, a dual pair, between an object and, and uh, uh, A and an object B, where we say that A is left dual to B, is defined as a pair of morphisms 
Uh, so one morphism from the unit object to A tensor B, and, uh, and the other uh, morphism from B tensor A to uh, the uh, unit. So you can think of it as some kind of identity here that we are building. And here are some evaluation. So this is sometimes called co-evaluation map and evaluation map. OK, so typically we have that when A, imagine that A is a, is a uh, um, finite dimensional vector space. And this is B is the uh, vector space of its, uh, I mean, it's dual vector space of forms. OK, so like this is V and V star. OK, uh, and so we ask that these uh, equations are, zigzag equalities are satisfied, OK, which uh, are represented uh, like this. And we said that, uh, yeah, so, I, so in, that, in that case, we said that A is a right dual of B. Uh, uh, and yes. So anyway, a ribbon category uh, is simply defined now as a balanced category. So if you remember, it means braiding, twisting, OK? Uh, but moreover, every object A has a right dual. And there is this uh, further uh, requirement that when I take A star tensor A and uh, I twist A and then I evaluate, so I get this map from A, A star tensor A into I, or I twist A star and then I evaluate, I should get the same. Okay. Uh, and uh, the nice thing is that once we, I mean, in any ribbon category, the object A star is also a left dual to A. And so you can use the twisting and the braiding to to build i mean the i mean a, a unit uh, so a co-evaluation map and an evaluation map but where you see a star is on the right now okay or oh, yes or here so a star is is not is not anymore just a right dual it's also a left dual thanks to this uh, uh, structure of twist and this uh, equation okay uh, and so in particular we have this nice uh, equation satisfied in every ribbon category, that twisting is the same as braiding and then doing this, uh, you know, playing between the uh, here co evaluation and co-evaluation, but this is the original uh, evaluation. And then this is the, uh, the one that we deduce from the twist, but we, we can also define the twist from that fact that A star is at the same time a right dual and a left dual of A. Okay, and I will come back to that later because we see the similar phenomena appearing in, in logic. And I claim that this is, of course, topology, but in fact, and this is really the purpose of, of you know, the, I mean, my, my work, but also this, this talk, okay, is to show that this kind of phenomena can also, I mean, it's interesting to look at them from a logical point of view. And there, there are some kind of maybe projections uh, or uh, of, of, of some, a more, um, uh, I mean, like let's say pure, purely logical structures about negations, okay? Because of course, when I say duality, I have in mind some kind of, of negations. And we will see that these uh, dualities can be seen as particular instances, extremely interesting and rich, but uh, instances of a more gen general pattern uh, where negation is not involutive anymore. So. Uh, so something important here in this uh, ribbon category is that when we dualize twice an object, we come back to the original object, uh, which is true, for instance, for finite dimensional vector spaces, or we will see representations, which is not true anymore for general vector spaces, because typically uh, the map from V to V is double negation, or is bidual is not an isomorphism. And so, um, I mean, what we see here, this phenomena, okay, I mean, this kind of very nice, uh, typically here, reconstruction uh, of the, uh, I mean, the, the twist here from uh, dualities. So, uh, you know, these uh, equ equ equations can be also played, and I will come back to that at the logical level, and I will explain how to do that. Okay, anyway, we have this free ribbon uh, category. So there's, there's this beautiful theorem by Schum, which says that the free ribbon category can be constructed. And uh, uh, it has, uh, okay, so it's a free ribbon category generated by a given category. 
So the objects are sine sequences of objects of C. So sine means that epsilon one, epsilon k are, are plus or minus to indicate the direction of the uh, links. And the morphisms are frame tangles. Uh, so frame tangles means they are ribbon. You know, uh, so you can draw them with ribbons with links labeled by maps in C. So this is a typical uh, example. So this is a map from A plus to B plus, C minus, D plus. And so you see A plus, this is the input. So the, the map goes in that direction. And the output is B plus. I mean, I could say B plus tensor, C minus tensor, D plus. And the C minus here, the minus means that the flow of, you know, of the computation goes in that direction. OK, so this is typically a map in this free ribbon category. Okay, and so clearly, I want to, uh, you remember that in the free Cartesian closed category, the maps were uh, proofs, they were lambda terms, they were very symbolic objects, uh, whereas here it's purely topological. And so my, my purpose in the next uh, 15 minutes is to show you that there is a way to think about lambda terms, at least uh, in, in uh, good situations where the lambda terms are, are linear, uh, I will explain that, okay? And you can think of, 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 of this, uh, you know, in connection to the next talk by uh, Noam Zeilberger. Uh, so when the lambda terms are linear, uh, then we get a very, I mean, slightly mysterious, but also very natural, I mean, the two, uh, connection between proofs and, and nuts. And so, uh, as I was saying, okay, this, category here for the free ribbon category has this beautiful property that it's the, it defines the free ribbon category. So every time we have a category with braiding, twists, and good dualities, we can take any functor from C to D. So here, really, you should think of this functor as giving an interpretation to each of the uh, uh, links here. Okay, so, so we give an interpretation to each of the links, and then uh, just from the fact that this category is, is ribbon, we can lift this functor to, uh, to a functor where the tangles, of course, it's very important here, the frame tangles, but in the topological sense, okay, so really uh, modulo deformation, if you like, are interpreted as morphisms of this category. And uh, it's, it's a way to construct uh, many invariants of, of, of knots in, in uh, topology. And so, uh, uh, so uh, I, will, I will try to explain how this can be uh, adapted. But maybe before that, I will say, I mean, I think it's nice, especially here, uh, to spend maybe five minutes explaining how we construct such ribbon categories. Okay, before I move back to uh, proof, uh, because I want to show also that the fact that I look at proof has to do with finite dimensional versus like inf in possi possibly infinite dimensional repre representations of, of quantum groups. Uh, so uh, the idea is that one way to construct these ribbon categories uh, is to define them as categories of modules over uh, half uh, al algebras. So uh, suppose given like a symmetric monoidal category V, so you can, for instance, take the category of vector spaces over a field, okay? So a bi-algebra is an object H of the category V equipped with a multiplication uh, and a co-multiplication. Okay? And so I use this diagram here for blue for multiplication. Remember, I always draw, oops, sorry. I go from uh, below to top. So this is multiplication of H and uh, and unit and co-multiplication and co-unit. And we should ask these equations so that uh, that you know, okay, so typically this is the bi-algebra uh, equation, which is which says that multiplication and co-multiplication are compatible in this way, okay? And uh, then similarly for, uh, I mean, unit and co-multiplication, multiplication and co-unit and unit and co-unit. Uh, then an antipode is, is uh, defined as a morphism from H to H, which satisfies these uh, uh, two equations. 
And whenever we have uh, such, uh, okay, so Hopf algebra, which is a bi-algebraic with, with an antipode, then we can construct a monoidal closed category of left modules where uh, the action on the, the home, okay, the internal home, is defined by this uh, formula. So I wrote it in the Swidler uh, style. Okay. Uh, and this generalizes the, the usual construction for groups, okay, where so you can think, uh, you know, of the, your alpha algebra as a group, and then what you're asking, I mean, here, this says that you should uh, multiply each input by the inverse of H, apply the function, and then multiply by H. Uh, and so this is just the quantum group version, but there is the diagrammatic representation of it, okay, uh, that uh, I just uh, show you um, here. So that means that this object, the right negation, uh, has uh, has uh, I mean is a, is an H module. Okay. Uh, similarly, there is a, a also a way uh, when the antipode is reversible uh, to define uh, a closure on the left. And so similarly, except that we need to use this inversible, I mean, inverse of, of the antipode, and we'll get the, the good uh, properties, required properties. Uh, so this is a way to get, uh, you know, this implication um, here. Uh, I mean, so, so it's mono, what we get is a monoidal closed category on the two sides, left and right. But now maybe we want that uh, to have also a braided uh, monoidal category. So for that purpose, uh, we uh, introduce a notion of braiding on the Hopf algebra, which is uh, in fact a vector of H tensor H, which satisfies a number of properties which can be represented diagrammatically uh, like this. And now the important point uh, here is that every braiding, okay, induces a braiding. So a braiding on the Hopf algebra induces a braiding on the category of uh, left H modules, okay? And the idea is that you just uh, take V, I mean, like a, a vector, like V tensor W, you swap W I mean, and V and you apply uh, your, uh, I mean, you multiply the braiding, okay, of your up algebra at the same time as you permute the uh, vectors V and W, okay? And so uh, then, uh, what we uh, get from that is, is a way to relate the uh, let's say right negation with the left negation. Uh, and this is extremely uh, important from you know, uh, my angle, like logical angle, we, because it's really saying that this braiding will induce a map from the left negation or right negation to the left negation. Uh, and that this can be understood in a very like logical way, as I will, as I will uh, explain. And this map, in fact, can be. Uh, I mean, if we compute it, this map, it re what it does, it associates to any uh, form here, this form where uh, we precompose uh, the form with an action of uh, u, and uh, u is, is is equal to this uh, uh, vector here and can be represented uh, in this way, okay? And this is an extremely important uh, 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 vector in the theory of uh, quantum, quantum groups. Uh, the thing is that uh, it's uh, as a, a bad property is that it's not a group-like uh, element. And so in order to obtain a group-like element in the Hopf algebra, uh, the, I mean, the very uh, natural ways to define uh, a, a twist. So this is where we get back to ribbons, mm -hmm. which is uh, just a vector of H satisfying these equations that I, I, I drew here di diagrammatically. And then when you multiply the U with this uh, twist, or its inverse, well, suddenly you get a group-like element. Okay. And there is a, an element of magic, I, I mean, uh, in this uh, thing. Uh, this is something I try to understand in the, let's say, uh, from the outside, looking at, at, at uh, uh, let's say, braided monoidal categories and so on. 
Uh, and the reason why it's very important is that, in fact, it's related to this. I mean, I mean, all the work here that I'm describing was I mean, really developed by uh, Reshetikin and Turayev in the 90s. And they're, I mean, they're, they're really the fundamental, I mean, the fundamental observation is that if we take the finite dimensional modules, this defines a ribbon category. Okay, and so if I go back to my little picture uh, before, Okay, uh, sorry for that, but here I, I have this category of finite dimensional representations of my, uh, you know, uh, hub algebras with, with, with structure. And so I can interpret ribbons as um, morphisms between such representations. Okay, and then uh, using that, we can construct uh, invariants of the of the uh, uh, ribbons. So it's a beautiful recipe. And I try to think about what, I mean, it's logical meaning. And so to that purpose, I will introduce the notion of dialogue uh, category. So, you know, like ribbon is about ribbons. And since I want to speak about dialogue games, uh, I, I found it's nice to call my categories like dialogue categories, but you will see uh, uh, they are extremely st stupid category. I mean, the way they are defined is absolutely, uh, uh, obvious, okay? So the, the the important thing here is the connection with game semantics, the thing I was telling you before, and the idea that there are, and look, and the proofs are, are, are based on interactions. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, so a dialogue category is just uh, defined as a category with an object uh, bottom and the natural bijection so I mean, we ask that there is a way to uh, turn any map from A and sub B to this object, which I will call bottom. Uh, and you can think of it, for instance, as the base field uh, into a map from B into A implies bottom. Okay, so this is a very uh, uh, familiar situation in I mean, I mean, let's say linear algebra. So we can do that for on the left or on the right. And this is just a definition of a dialogue category. So it's very stupid and primitive. Uh, the important thing is that then we can uh, look at, uh, introduce the notion of pivotal dialogue category, which is a category where we can play with the inputs of uh, forms. So whenever I have a map from A tensor B to bottom, I can turn it into a map from B tensor A into bottom. Uh, and this is the way I like to represent that. So it's going, I mean, like this. And we I mean, and then when asked a coherence diagram, which says that if I, you know, turn A and then turn B, it should be the same as turning A times B. And this can be understood as some kind of coherence property or coherence properties of a map between the two negations that is here, the coherence property is here. But uh, what is uh, important here is that uh, we get from this, I mean, a notion of dialogue category with uh, you know, um, so, okay, so this was a pivotal uh, dialogue category, but we could also say, okay, I will define a balanced dialogue category just as a dialogue category with these two negations, a braiding and a twist. And the important uh, property is that every balanced dialogue category is defines a pivotal category. And uh, what is, I mean, an important observation is that we really need the twist to do that. So the idea is that whenever I have a map from A and sub B to bottom, I can pre-compose it with a braiding, but also with a twist on, on, on A here. Uh, and really the intuition is that the, I mean, this operation of wheel I was describing here can be described at the same time as, a I mean, you see here is there is a twist and a braiding. So the braiding would not be sufficient. And this is the same, I mean, this is really related to what happens with Hopf algebras. So, um, in the case of uh, Hopf algebra, if you remember, we needed a little theta to make, uh, to construct a, a group-like uh, element in H. And here it's the same story that, I mean, in that, okay, because, I mean, when we have a good uh, ribbon of algebra, in fact, the, uh, the category of general representations, so finite dimensional and, and infinite dimensional, defines such a, a, a balanced dialogue category. And now from this uh, structure, so in particular, I mean, so it satisfies this pivotal uh, coherence property. And from that, uh, what we get is that 
uh, when bottom is uh, the unit uh, object of this uh, I mean dialog category, then that the finite dimensional H modules define a ribbon category. So before what's, I mean, it was, I mean, here it can be de de uh, deduced from a purely, for, I mean, a purely categorical and formal way that we have this property. Uh, so uh, I will, uh, so I don't have too much time. So I will just uh, uh, show you a little, I mean, connection between proofs and nuts that uh, makes it even more, uh, uh, I mean, uh, meaningful. So the observation is that, you know, in a ribbon category, every object bottom, in fact, defines a left and a right negation where whenever you dualize the object, you tensor it with this um, bottom, okay? And so uh, now, uh, in the same way as we constructed the free Cartesian closed category, we can construct the free balance dialogue category. So I will show you the way it's constructed is very similar as the construction for free Cartesian closed category. So it's just, the objects are, let's say, formulas constructed with the tensor product left negation and right negation. And then the maps are proofs. Okay. And so uh, proofs of a logic that I call tensorial logic because it has to do with tensorial algebra. Uh, and the proofs are constructed exactly in the same way, you know, using the same, let's say, Genson like, uh, you know, uh, Genson like constructions of proofs. But there is, of course, a little care about uh, uh, so the so-called exchange rule, so uh, of logic. Okay, so we need to care a little bit because this this is really about. I mean, we we are manipulating the hypothesis of a, of a proof, and so we manipulate them with with knots and ribbons. So we need to have a little bit of information about that. But this can be very nicely uh, done using. I mean, the traditional proof theory is just a very a basic uh, adaptation of it. And from that, we get the free dialogue category uh, with a, a ribbon structure. And uh, now we know that uh, every time we have a ribbon category and we fix an object bottom, uh, this defines a dialogue category here. So where we have uh, you know, two negations on the left and on the right. And so just because it's the free dialogue category, we can construct this functor and the main theorem and i will uh, stop uh, here is that the functor is faithful okay and so what that, this means is that two proofs here in this uh, uh, log i mean this is the world of logic this is the world of topology two proofs are equal in this category if and only if the underlying uh, ribbon structure is the same and so i will just show you uh, an application of that because this can, this can be seen as a coherence theorem for uh, dialogue category. So imagine I take A, uh, an object in the dialogue category, and I map it here to its double negation. And this map is not uh, involutive. Think, for instance, you know, you're working in the category of general representations uh, of, uh, you know, quantum group, for instance. So this is not, I mean, this is not uh, uh, invertible. And then uh, we can also take this other negation to uh, to where we take the left and right negation and we change the order, then we can apply, you know, the, the two turns here so that enables to connect these two negations to these two negations. And the point is that we don't, I mean, if we do that, we, it's not equal to this one. We need to twist also the output and to see why, in fact, so this commutative diagram, I mean, imagine we want to prove that it's commutative in any dialogue category. And so we need only to prove that it's commutative in the free dialogue category. And how do we do? Uh, well, we construct, the, we see the two maps as proofs. Okay, so there are the, here are the two maps. This is, uh, this one is here. And this, this composition is here. And then we look at the uh, images through this, oops, through this functor here. Uh, and the images are just tangles. Okay, and the tangles, what they do, they follow, they track uh, the manipulations we do on the formulas and in particular on this bottom. So they track the bottoms. And then the two tangles here are equal and we know that the proofs are equal. Yes, so I'm, I, I mean, I could speak more, but I, I think uh, I'm finished with time.
Uh, yes, and, uh, uh, maybe you could I mean, leave some uh, time maybe for questions. I should just say one word that these tangles here, what they represent, and maybe I will just show you this picture. That, okay, what they represent is the flow of negations in the dialogue between the opponent and the player. So if you remember at the very beginning, uh, we had this interaction between the prover and uh, uh, refutation. And in fact, these tangles here, uh, they can be also understood, I mean, they can be understood as little strategies where opponent ask a question, or maybe I, I should I could play here. Opponent ask a question and then the player answers here. Yeah. And so there is this interesting, uh, relationship that I think it would be, I mean, is worth exploring more between proofs and, and topology. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Paul André. Uh, let us let, let the place for the dialogue. Ah, je crois que, I'm, I'm not sure we can hear you. I'm, at least I cannot. Yes. Cannot. Do you hear me, ah. Paul André? I can hear you. Uh, okay, I can. Yeah, good. Does anybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, sorry, it was my fault. Yeah. No, no, was... it, is, it is because now you are on the dialogue, dialogue mode, <laughs> mode. Yeah, but I realized that you, during all that talk, uh, I had the sound off. I didn't realize that. So if you wanted to stop me, I was like, you know, a raging bull. I don't know. Like, you know like... Okay. <sighs> so. Uh, um, yeah. Are there uh, questions? Uh, actually, I have a question, it's Maxim Kansevich. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I got lost a bit when you discuss this, um, all this breeding. Do you introduce because there's so much literature, it's kind of polluted by breedings, or, or it's really in this dialogue, since it's you don't introduce breeding by hand and it appears by itself? Ah, uh, well, the thing is, uh, there is this, this dream we have to to understand the topology of proofs. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, in the traditional uh, uh, you know, uh, logic, yeah. uh, we have this so-called exchange rule. So yeah. Yeah. where we need, I mean, clearly when we describe, this comes from Genson, it's an old tradition, yeah. Yeah. we need to permute the hypothesis in a proof. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and so the, the thing is usually we don't track, we don't track the, the permutations, okay? We, we say yeah. it's a symmetry. Yeah. But then it, it makes sense to uh, say that whenever we have such a ah, ah, so it's kind of it's this kind of generalization in yes, yes. by notional brevity, but, I see. Yeah. But yeah. I would not say I mean yeah it's generalization, but I would say it's, it's a more refined picture because yeah. this can be done. But now we track, we remember, mm -hmm. and so now in the proofs. So okay, so typically just to show you a proof, we will remember the permutations. Traditionally, we don't mm -hmm. because we don't care. Uh, uh, but uh, now, because we track them, we can get uh, this okay, free construction, but yeah. which is which is uh, which has the let's say it's a, some kind of grammar, like a categorical grammar for infinite dimensional vector spaces mm. with braiding. So I mean, and so the braiding yeah, will uh, be uh, produced no, by, no, I see, yeah, I see, yeah, yeah. by the by the Hopf algebra action. Yeah. And that's the idea, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, maybe I just want to give a comment if you, because it's braiding it's, seems to be, it's kind of a bit artificial, like fashion instance, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you consider just notion of bi-algebra, yeah? yeah? Without antipod, unit, co-unit, just very yeah. simple product and co-product. Yeah. And look how many, is this a basis of map from n power to m power? Uh, yeah, of course there's some kind of normal form, but in, in, intrinsically there are also some three-dimensional manifolds, with some, band, mm -hmm. uh, some colorings, yeah. So it's, Yes, so it's even without braiding one can see three dimensional picture. Yeah, yeah. So that's 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 uh, uh, that's uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, and maybe okay. The, you know, re really, all this work started from this more. Uh, I mean, you know, no braid. I mean, no, no, braiding. Yeah. But but where where I manipulate trees. Yeah. So uh, I I agree. I mean. Uh, but what I wanted to show is that this phenomena that I, I, I agree with you there, I mean, they're, they're, they appear and it's, they're a bit questionable. Okay, what, what are they doing? That in fact, from they, 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 have, they have some kind of, they can be understood at a logical level. That's what I mean before, because the thing is when we look at ribbons, 
uh, diagrams, we see a lot of phenomena. It's difficult to understand what is really coming from the topology and what is coming from the fact that we can negate, I mean, we can turn things. And, and so the, the story that I want to tell, so for instance, I mean, just to say very briefly, uh, this thing which, I mean, which would have emerged anyway in proof theory without, we didn't, we, so this operation that I was describing here, of permuting, you know, two. I mean, by by doing this kind of operation, of of of, you know, if we think of a proof as something very concrete, not not something you know in the air, but something that people manipulate, and in space and time, you know, like like we discuss, uh, then we see that that this operation is very natural, and then we see that the the twist appears here. So so there is this, I would say. Uh, uh, surprising and slightly, I mean, we want to understand it's not okay, th this, these connections. And maybe just, yeah, that's, that's, but I, I, I agree. And I, I would need, you know, I think we need many faults, I mean, at some point to avoid maybe these uh, braidings. And yeah, 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 no, no, my suggestion is really to avoid braiding, make something simpler. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's and in other things, it's just uh, all these games uh, uh, also relate to logic in some different way. When you consider a statement which, which sequences for any they exist, for any they exist, it's like a game, yeah? Like different. Ah, yes, with the exist. But uh, so there is, yes, so maybe I should mention very briefly, I mean, just this last, uh, there is something that I, I wanted to, to say that there is an interesting open problem. I mentioned the exponential modality, which you can cons think of, of it as a co free commutative commonoid. Okay, generated by, you know, uh, and I, for the moment, I mean, so uh, recently, not, not, not very long ago, uh, uh, like, I mean, people like Daniel Murphett have, have you know, studied uh, this construction uh, in, in the category of uh, vector spaces. So, uh, and so, it, and in fact, I mean, I, I've shown that it's connected to, the, you know, Friedler's finite dual construction that, uh, you know, and so this is when, I mean, uh, I mean, this, this construction is, is far, I mean, for, I mean far, far from obvious for me. Uh, and I would be interested to see how uh, this construction, which we know now on vector spaces, could be lifted to representations. I, uh, maybe it exists, but I, I don't know it. And this is the kind of things I like to discuss with uh, Gérard and, and the connection with automata theory uh, here. And I, you know, all the story I've, I've told was about uh, uh, linear, so let's say uh, arguments where we cannot repeat hypotheses. Uh, and so in the case of the drinker formula, the, the point is that we can, we can construct a, a, a co-free, I mean, the algebraically, the story is explained like this, that we can construct a co-free commutative commonoid above the existential. So we have the existential. And this is what enables us to backtrack and change the witness. So if you remember the first time I, uh, I, I was taking the Gérard as an existential, and then I moved to Nicolas. And algebraically, this corresponds to the fact that I can construct this bank, so here, so the co-free commutative commonoid on top of a formula which contains an existential. And, and honestly, uh, I don't fully understand how this could be uh, you know, uh, ex uh, expressed in the language of uh, you know, uh, these Hopf algebras. But I'm, I, I mean, I would love to have elements because that helps me to understand the uh, material nature of proofs. I mean, this is really the point in a way. The, uh, the, uh, uh... Uh, I take the opportunity to speak to you directly, uh, disregarding maybe questions, but we will, uh, I will ask for questions afterwards. Uh, Paul André, dear Paul André, uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, the Swidler's dual uh, constructed for, for uh, the scalars being uh, in a field, which, for, for, as you mentioned, the uh, vector spaces uh, encounters uh, uh, problems even when the scalars form form a um, um, division, form a, not a division ring, form, form a, a domain, a, mm -hmm. a, a ring without zero divisors. But I have uh, been aware of a, a paper by Porst, P O R. Yeah, yeah. Are you know it? Maybe. Yeah. Ah, yes. So I, 
I don't have to send you. No, no, but it's uh, uh, so. So I okay. I, I try to uh, adapt. I mean, this this construction mm -hmm. to a situation where I mean so, some some shift like or pre shift theoretic construction where I change the the base ring commutative ring, uh, and so I needed to to generalize this. Yes, to yes. and so I use, but it's very categorical. Yes, and uh, and the question then is, we under, would like to understand better the combinatorics behind. Ah, okay. And that's what I mean. Yes. So I mean, for 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 very you know kind of general reasons, you, there exists such a, such a, a co-free commutative commonoid for like any comm commutative ring, but it's not clear why. I mean, no. What I find yes. fascinating is that there is all this connection with 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 your work and differentiation things that I, I would need to understand better. And so I just wanted to mention this um, uh, for okay, me. We can yeah. interact in a way. The paper yeah, yeah, of I... course. I would, I would okay, love to. Okay, yeah. okay. Other questions, please? Sorry if I missed it, but why exactly do you need to find a dual here? Do you need it to define exclamation mark A or do you need to dualize it? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's about this. Um, so, I mean, when you get to, uh, when you want to work with, um, um, so, okay, so what happened, okay, I, I will, uh, so what happens is traditional models of, uh, because it is, this has to do with linear logic. So what happens with, with traditional uh, models of linear logic is that, in fact, we are able to build mo using topological, uh, you know, vector spaces or this kind of things. We're able to define the co-free commutative commonoid by uh, some kind of variation on the uh, general, I mean, symmetric algebra uh, construction. So, uh, and so we get something like, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, powers, I mean, tensorial powers of A uh, to the N. Uh, sim we symmetrize it. We, we do some, some clever, you know, uh, co-limit con construction. It's not anymore a sum. And we get something. When we dualize it, uh, this gives the co-free commutative commonoid. Uh, in the case of vector spaces, like you know, with no topology, there is this construction which I find extremely, I mean, mysterious, where you uh, use the fact that every co-algebra uh, induces an algebra structure on the dual, and then you uh, do some kind of uh, clever. Uh, Clever uh, restriction of the on the double double uh, uh, on the bidual, so that you get the co-free commutative common. I'm not sure it answers your question, but I just wanted to to say that to me, I kind of understand it, but honestly, I don't understand it. I mean, I understand it from the outside, but I don't have a completely clear combinatorial. Uh, and this is what I hope I understand. I will. I will get from you know, uh, this kind of uh, work by Gerard and Christian. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry, I, 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 we could discuss offline, and I, I would be happy. But I will need to thank think you about, very much. Uh, so we, we, we resume at uh, thirteen thirty. Thank you.